Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin, and welcome to Friday Morning Virtual Journal Club. Um, we are actually approaching a one-year anniversary uh, since the start of this program, and I am extremely excited about uh, this morning's speakers and an exciting area um, in thyroid cancer management. So it's my extreme pleasure to introduce Dr. Naifa Bassetti, is, um, who is a tenured professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, she is widely recognized for her clinical and research accomplishments in the management of aggressive thyroid cancer. In addition to directing the Thyroid Nodule Clinic, her work as a leader on NCI and industry-sponsored trials, um, investigating molecular mechanisms for disease progression and targeted therapy to improve patient outcomes. She serves on the NCCN Thyroid Cancer Guideline Committee as well as the, Amer the board of ITOG, and she has been extremely active in leadership roles at the ATA. Um, so, Naifa, thank you um, for joining us. And then um, uh, all of you who have been weekly listeners uh, to this broadcast um, have had the pleasure of, uh, of hearing uh, Lori, Dr. Lori Wirth, who um, is Elizabeth and Michael Ruane Endowed Chair of Medical Oncology. Uh, she's the Medical Director of the Center for Head and Neck Cancers at Mass General and she is also an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Wirth is a, a truly a leading authority in advanced thyroid cancer and head and neck oncology, special expertise in com combined modality therapy for cancers of the head and neck, immunotherapy, and molecular targeted therapies for thyroid cancer. Her research focuses on clinical um, trials and using translational data to maximize the impact of clinical trial outcomes. And um, she is certainly uh, more than qualified um, to be our expert discussant this morning. She serves as co-director of the Mass General Mass Ioneer Advanced Thyroid Cancer Clinic. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn over um, uh, this session to uh, Dr. Bassetti. And once again, thank you all for joining us. And Naipa, thank you for agreeing to speak this morning. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Um, I want to first thank Dr. Mark Erkin and the Thank Foundation for um, inviting me today to be a part of this uh, awesome virtual uh, journal club. I think it's a fantastic idea, and in these times when we can't get together, um, to be able to share knowledge and exchange ideas uh, to help improve things for our patients is fantastic. Uh, of course, leave it to surgeons to plan something at like six or seven in the morning. Um, I'm sorry that my camera doesn't work, um, but I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. So today we're going to be talking about the article, The Efficacy of Targeted Therapy for Resensitization to Radioactive Iodine in Advanced Thyroid Cancer, uh, the MD Anderson Experience. So it's, it's a mouthful. I um, want to talk a little bit about, uh, my, these are my relevant uh, financial disclosures. So I want to talk a little bit about the background of thyroid cancer uh, to begin with. Uh, so, you know, everyone here knows that thyroid cancer is, is very rare. Um, today's, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about the papillary and follicular thyroid carcinomas, and I'll be um, calling it differentiated thyroid cancer throughout, which is uh, the most common uh, thyroid cancer. And so uh, the standard therapies for differentiated thyroid cancers are surgery followed by radioactive iodine, and um, often we need to repeat both of those, uh, and then followed by thyroid hormone suppression. And we always want to keep that in mind because the vast majority of patients will do well with these therapies. But when it comes to metastatic disease, um, I want us to remember that while the total, if you take the total number of differentiated thyroid cancer cases, if recurrent differentiated thyroid cancer represents 30%, metastatic differentiated thyroid cancer represents uh, 10%, but what we're talking about today, the radioactive iodine refractory differentiated thyroid cancer only makes up about 5% of this rare disease. Um, and so that's why, you know, it's, there's a lot of controversy and a lot more research that's needed um, to further this field. And just to remind everybody that staging does predict uh, survival, uh, just like in other cancers, and that patients who 
have lung metastases that take up radioactive iodine have a better overall survival than those patients shown here in red who have lung metastases that do not take up radioactive iodine with a 10-year overall survival of 38% in those with radioactive iodine refractory lung metastases. So we always need to keep in mind that the treatment options for metastatic disease are always include TSH suppression and radioactive iodine, and that should be at the center core of um, everything that uh, one thinks about when they start the treatment. But of course, then there's localized therapies, surgeries, radiation that can be used, and of course, systemic therapies. So um, just to show the data that radioactive iodine does improve overall survival for patients with stage 3, 4 disease. So when they take up iodine, it should be used. And um, overall survival is also improved with TSH suppression. So we have fairly active, uh, effective, sorry, cancer therapies, and we should keep that throughout. So when we talk about metastatic differentiated thyroid cancer um, in, in the patients that we're going to be discussing today, they're going to have radioactive iodine refractory disease, uh, and they should have uh, uh, progression or clinically significant disease. Um, and then uh, if the progression is amenable to localized therapy, then one considers that. And then um, we, if, they're, if they're not amenable to localized therapy, one will consider systemic therapy. So it's this group of patients that we're talking about. So just to review the group of patients that have radioactive iodine refractory in the definition. So patients who have no iodine uptake at the known sites of disease, um, or if one has been treated, if a patient has been treated with radioactive iodine within the past six to 12 months, and that they have confirmed disease progression in those areas that had iodine uptake, or if the total cumulative dose of radioactive iodine was 600 millicuries or more. Um, and then the fourth category is if there is FDG avidity on a PET scan. Now, I say this, that these are written in order of decreasing evidence as you go down. For today's discussion, the groups of patients that were included in our paper had um, the definitions one through three. So these groups of patients that have this radioactive iodine therapy, if you look at the ATA's response to therapy category, um, the patients included here are patients who had structural incomplete response, right? Because those are the patients that are at high risk for death and um, more than likely will have continued persistent disease. So those are the patients who uh, require therapy and fit in this category. So if you look at the American Thyroid Association guidelines for patients with asymptomatic stable disease that's radioactive iodine refractory, then we tend to just keep them on TSH suppression of thyroid hormone and, and image them um, uh, quite often to evaluate if they have clinically significant or progressive disease. And of course, we have a slew of site-specific treatments, namely surgery, radiation, and bone-modifying agents for localized uh, treatments. But the guidelines uh, talk about if patients have progressive or si clinically significant disease, that we should consider systemic therapy, right? Whether it's kinase inhibitors or clinical trials. And so what I'm pointing out, this is our disclaimer for today's journal club, is that the guidelines don't say, go ahead and do resensitization and redifferentiation with radioactive iodine, which is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, but they do talk about putting patients on clinical trials uh, and try to go forward. So to understand um, uh, targeted therapy and some of the systemic therapies that are uh, there available for thyroid cancer, we need to understand what the targets are for thyroid cancer. So as everybody here knows, um, the BRAF, so I don't know if you can see my pointer, um, the majority of thyroid cancer, of papillary thyroid cancers have a BRAF mutation, so in this MAP kinase pathway, um, but RAS mutations are also common. And then rarely we'll have RET PTC shown there on the right, uh, alterations in differentiated uh, thyroid cancer, as well as NTREC alterations. Rarely um, uh, we'll see um, alterations in the left-hand column or the PI3 kinase pathway. The reason this, import, it, this is important is obviously drugs have been developed to inhibit this MAP kinase pathway, but it's also this very MAP kinase pathway when it's upregulated that causes cell proliferation that also downregulates the sodium iodide symporter that allows iodine to get in. So the targeted therapies that are available um, and approved in thyroid cancer are shown here. Um, for differentiated thyroid cancer uh, that's progressive, serafinib and lenvatinib, 
although not FDA approved in differentiated, but approved in medullary, vendetinib, and cabozantinib are also used in differentiated thyroid cancer that's radioactive iodine refractory. And then um, dibrafidib and trametinib, although FDA approved in anaplastic thyroid cancer, are also used in differentiated thyroid cancer. But then there's also uh, targeted therapies that are approved by the FDA for what's called tumor agnostic, uh, meaning it doesn't matter what tumor it is or the histology of the tumor as long as they have this alteration. So if a thyroid cancer patient has an NTRK or NTREC alteration, then uh, larotrectinib and entrectinib are approved for those patients. And if patients have RET alterations, salpercatinib and pralcetinib are FDA approved for those patients. And then um, if the thyroid cancer uh, has a microsatellite instability that's high, then immunotherapy, namely pembrolizumab, is FDA approved. So we now have a, a large slew of drugs that can be used in these patients. And thinking about these patients, when we um, uh, look at their tumors and what the genetic alterations are, we need to understand these drugs and what they inhibit as well. Um, and if we look at the response rates in thyroid cancer, it's the third column, I'm sorry, you can't see my pointer, um, that shows that the response rates in thyroid cancer are any, on average about 30 to 50% where you actually see tumor shrinkage, but you will see here, um, well, you can't see my pointer, but um, where you look at the RET and NTREC inhibitors where you can get response rates up to almost 80%. Um, and so, uh, you know, just thinking about uh, this, that yes, these drugs are efficacious, they're not cures, they do cause shrinkage, and um, they can be well tolerated and managed, um, but we always want to sort of think about further clinical trials, combination therapies, and outside of the box. These drugs do have um, a, a, sl a slew of toxicities as well that need to be managed and thought about ahead of time. So that gets us to our topic today, or enhancing radioactive iodine uptake, or what can we think about beyond um, those therapies that are currently approved. So um, it's just a reminder that radioactive iodine uh, is a form of targeted, ther tar targeted therapy, but we're talking about um, patients here that are refractory to radioactive iodine, right? So lots of investigators over many, many years have thought about what are, if you know the tumors are rendered resistant to radioactive iodine, what are ways and drugs that we can use to resensitize or re-differentiate um, uh, the tumor so that it does take up iodine and then we can use radioactive iodine uh, again. And so some of the background, there's a lot of elegant work that has been done by many, many people, preclinical and clinical work. Um, and um, I'm sharing with you today some of the work that was done uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but there has been done quite a bit of work in many other uh, institutions. And the idea was many drugs were tried to resensitize the tumors to radioactive iodine. And unfortunately, many of those drugs failed and just wouldn't do it. And then there were some uh, brilliant animal studies that showed that um, patients, the patients' tumors who have, uh, or um, it, it actually started in, in animal studies, that there was reduced mRNA expression involved in iodine metabolism in, patient, in tumors that had BRAF V600 um, mutations, and that the NIS mediated iodine or the sodium iodide symporter mediated iodine uptake was decreased, and that a MEK inhibitor can suppress that MAP kinase upregulation in these tumors and can restore the expression of the iodide metabolizing genes. So, some promising things saying, hey, these treatments may actually work. And then when there was a doxycycline-induced BRAF V600E tumors in mice, in thyroid follicular cells that developed poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, that they had an inability to incorporate re, uh, radioactive iodine. But if you deactivate um, that doxycycline-induced, then you, get, you can restore that normal architecture and restore radioactive iodine sensitivity. So this led to clinical trials and um, I'm gonna share with you uh, two of them. The selumetinib is a MEK inhibitor um, that is, was uh, evaluated. It's not actually used in treatment of thyroid cancer, but it was a brilliant experiment by Dr. Ho et al. In, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they gave the patients four weeks of selumetinib um, to patients who had Radi to uh, 20 patients that had radioactive iodine resistant thyroid cancer. And what they found is that using this drug for four weeks, they can increase the uptake in 12 of those patients. And uh, nine of the patients had a BRAF mutation and four of them took up radioactive iodine. 
five of those patients had an NRAS mutation and all five took up radioactive iodine. So eight out of those 12 patients that increased their uptake in radioactive iodine reached the dosimity threshold for, for treatment and were treated with radioactive iodine and five out of those eight patients had a confirmed partial response or good shrinkage in their tumors. Four of them had an NRAS and one had a BRAF. So just keep that in mind for the end for the discussion. So this led to very promising um, uh, um, uh, treatments and suggestions that, hey, we can use radioactive iodine to cause tumor shrinkage and we can resensitize these tumors. And I just wanted to show you some pictures from that paper because it shows on the left where they had radioactive iodine resistant disease. And then after solumetinib, this beautiful uptake that they could then use to, tr to treat with radioactive iodine and stop the solumetinib. And then our very own discussant, Dr. Lori Wirth, uh, group looked at pa uh, patients who had BRAF uh, V600E mutated uh, papillary thyroid cancers and gave these patients one month of debrafenib, a BRAF inhibitor, to 10 patients and then did a whole body scan and showed that you can uh, increase radioactive iodine uptake and then uh, treated those who had uptake with radioactive iodine. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that the waterfall plot where each bar represents a patient, where you see nice shrinkage in the tumors that did take up iodine compared to um, those that did not take up, up, uh, up to, did not take up radioactive iodine on the right-hand side. This is just the waterfall plot from that trial, just to emphasize uh, and uh, to show you the shrinkage that can be uh, observed with these patients uh, with the radioactive iodine. And then the debrafenib was stopped. So that led us to look at our own experience and this, the, the subject of today's paper or the efficacy of targeted therapy for resensitization to radioactive iodine in advanced thyroid cancer patients. Um, so the objectives of this study was to assess additional tumor response after radioactive iodine therapy post tumor redifferentiation with targeted therapy, right? So can we get more uh, shrinkage after um, radioactive iodine compared to um, just the targeted therapy alone? And to um, assess disease control rate post radioactive iodine therapy and off all other systemic therapies. And then to predict markers of tumor redifferentiation for targeted therapy. So we had some lofty goals um, and ended up with a small trial. So, um, and we can discuss more of that uh, at the end as well. So this was a retrospective chart review um, where we had patients who had progressive radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer. And these patients, we took patients that were already on a targeted therapy, whether it was a MEK inhibitor or a BRAF inhibitor for all these patients. They were either, tr all of the patients had to have the progressive disease, but they were, the, the reason for putting them on the target therapy may have differed. So some of them were put on because they had progressive disease and we wanted to use the targeted therapy to treat the disease and others were put on the targeted therapy simply for the idea of tumor uh, resensitization. So all the patients had to have a diagnostic whole body scan while they were on the targeted therapy. Um, and 13 patients met our inclusion criteria. So patients were either, um, if their whole body scan did not take up iodine, they were not treated with radioactive iodine and they were continued on targeted therapy, or if they took up iodine, they were treated with radioactive iodine, the targeted therapy was stopped, and then uh, cross-sectional imaging and serum thyroglobulins were done afterwards for their follow-up. The baseline characteristics uh, are shown here. Um, half the patients were male, the mean age was 55, um, and most of the histologies were papillary thyroid cancer. And um, uh, nine of the 13 patients were, or two thirds of them had a BRAF V600E, um, but the second uh, largest group had an NRAS or a KRAS mutation, and one patient had a wild type. They had a median of one prior radioactive iodine with a median cumulative activity of 163 millicuries before the targeted therapy. And then all of them um, had had uh, prior treatments for uh, thyroid cancer. One, sorry about that. One of them did not, uh, wasn't able to have um, uh, their uh, thyroid removed, but had no uh, uptake in the whole body scan. I'm sorry, one of them didn't have radioactive iodine. So if we take these 13 patients 
Um, and we look at those who were not treated with radioactive iodine. It was four patients out of the 13 because they had inadequate uptake on their whole body scan. And then if we look at the nine out of the 13 patients that were actually treated with radioactive iodine, eight of them were based on increased uptake on whole body scan. One was empirically uh, treated despite it wasn't quite um, uh, you know, robust uptake uh, on the diagnostic scan, but there was enough to be able to uh, go forward. So I'm now going to focus on those nine patients that were treated. All of the patients that were um, not, that had inadequate uptake on the whole body scan to be determined to be treated um, had, uh, sorry, give me a second. Okay. Um, had had a BRAF uh, V600 uh, mutation and were on um, therapy for that median duration. So let's focus on those nine. So if we look at um, these patients, so this is like a, a, a variation of a swim plot. Uh, so each horizontal bar is a patient and um, the colors represent what mutation they had. So the blue bars are the BRAF mutation. There were five patients out of the nine that had a BRAF mutation. There were three patients that had a RAS mutation. One was KRAS shown in green and two were NRAS shown in uh, gray. And then one patient did not have, uh, you know, was wild type for both of those. So the duration of these patients being on targeted therapy, the median duration was three and a half months because again, some of these patients were placed on targeted therapy for the treatment of their disease and some were specifically placed on it for resensitization of their tumors. The diagnostic whole body scan was done in all these patients at this point in time. And this is what their whole body scan looked like um, before uh, their targeted therapy. On the left hand side is their whole body scan before uh, their targeted therapy. And then on the right hand side is their whole body scan after the uh, targeted therapy. And you can see that the majority of them had nice uptake, especially in the lungs. So this is just um, a, a larger picture of a couple of representative patients because I think pictures help explain things well. On the left-hand side is the negative whole body scan. Then the patient was given targeted therapy and you can see nice uptake in um, the lungs there and a bone lesion. And then here's an another patient with a negative whole body scan and you can see nice uptake in the lungs on that patient as well. So just to, uh, uh, to clarify what the redifferentiation strategy um, uh, overall is, that these patients have radioactive iodine refractory disease, they're placed on a kinase inhibitor, and then they're treated with radioactive iodine uh, if they take up iodine. And when, once they're treated with the radioactive iodine, the, the kinase inhibitor is stopped, right? So the advantage to the patient is you no longer have to take that uh, um, that targeted therapy for some time and we re-image you so you get your uh, break from treatment. So um, what happened uh, in this study? Uh, so on the left-hand side are the swim plots of the nine patients while that uh, the N, uh, X axis is the timeline that they were on the targeted therapy. And then the, they were treated, those who had uptake, which are all nine here, um, were treated with a median activity of 204 millicuries. Some were by dosimetry and others were uh, empiric dosing based on the uptake. And then we followed them um, uh, up afterwards with imaging. And the duration of the follow-up after the radioactive iodine uh, therapy, uh, there was a median duration of 14 months. And some of these patients were followed up to 20.6 months. So um, all the swim plots on the right are showing patients off of their targeted therapy. So this is the best response that was measured by RESIST criteria on the patients before they received their radioactive iodine therapy on the targeted therapy alone. And you can see that the vast majority of patients had stable disease. They did not have good shrinkage to be able to call them partial response. And one of these patients actually had had a progressive disease with an NRAS mutation on their MEK inhibitor. And this is the patient's uh, waterfall plot showing their best response after radioactive iodine therapy. And we've labeled the mutation there. Uh, the patients with the BRAF mutation are shown 
actually it's not colored, I apologize. The coloring is showing the response. So the blue patients shown in blue uh, is their partial response and in gray means that they had stable disease. And so after radioactive iodine therapy, you had uh, patients showing uh, shrinkage of disease, uh, but only three of them met the criteria to call it a partial response but at least we don't have that progressive disease, even in that patient who is progressing on targeted therapy. So if we were to overlap the responses, right, um, a crude way of sort of looking at, because people always ask the question, well, how do you know it wasn't the targeted therapy that caused the shrinkage and not your radioactive iodine? So we did this, um, we sort of made up this waterfall plot to look at the best response on targeted therapy before radioactive iodine shown in blue, and the same patient compared next to them showing their response on, on uh, sorry, after targeted therapy, uh, after radio, radioactive iodine, when they were off their um, uh, targeted therapy. And you can see, I mean, it's not a statistical analysis, but you can see that the responses look deeper, uh, the orange, than uh, the blue um, from targeted therapy alone pre-radioactive iodine. And this, I changed the color of the slide so it would stand out to say that this is not from this study. We did, we followed up those 13 patients later, uh, and this is not in the publication. So, and then we now um, looked at 42 patients of which 22 of them had long enough uh, follow-up to be able to evaluate them. And what we found was while only um, nine of them had had, 9% uh, had had a partial response, that the vast, majority of them had had stable disease, oops, sorry about that, but 40% of the patients did have some sort of decrease in their tumor after radioactive iodine shown here in purple. And I'm sorry about the transposition of the mutations uh, there, but so this is 22 patients, so a larger subset of uh, the patients we showed in this study. And in the same follow-up study of uh, 22 patients, the, uh, uh, when they were off their uh, uh, targeted therapy, we then looked at these patients for their progression-free survival and time to progression and showed that the median progression-free survival was 29 months with a median time to progression of 20 months. The median follow-up time with this study was 18 and a half months after radioactive iodine, right? Suggesting that maybe, you know, when, when we're looking at these patients and evaluating and they're asking, what is this therapy going to do for me if I take up iodine? We have a little more data to be able to tell them that potentially you could go a year um, and a half uh, off of uh, targeted therapy if you do take up radioactive iodine, we use it to treat you. So back to our study. Um, so this is just a, a patient example because pictures speak a thousand words of uh, the patient that had a KRAS mutation uh, and was treated with a MEK inhibitor and then um, had uptake of radioactive iodine. And we can uh, just pick on a sample lesion here um, shown with the red arrow pre-radioactive iodine and six months after radioactive iodine, you can see shrinkage in those uh, hyalur nodes that lit up on uh, the PET scan. And then uh, this is a, another example of a patient with a BRAF mutation patient who was treated with dibrafenib and pre-radioactive iodine. You can see on the left that they had that uh, larger uh, lung nodule and six months after radioactive iodine, it uh, shrunk quite a bit to the point that it almost can't be seen. And so obviously not everybody's story uh, right, is like that, and we need to do a better job of helping to figure out who um, can benefit from these therapies. And so an interesting uh, take home, but I realized this was very few patients, was looking at what happened to their thyroglobulin levels and or their thyroglobulin antibodies um, and the trends of the treated patients. So this was for the nine patients that were treated. And while it's hard to see because the scale is so different, right? Some of the patients had low thyroglobulins and some had elevated thyroglobulins. But if you blow this up, then um, you can see the uh, column in the middle is when the patients were on targeted therapy, that they're ex with the exception of one patient, that their thyroglobulins actually rose on targeted therapy. So without evidence of any progression of disease, if a thyroglobulin is rising on the targeted therapy, it potentially suggest, suggesting that we are gonna sensitize that patient's tumor to radioactive iodine. And then all, when they were, excuse me, treated with radioactive iodine, their thyroglobulins had come down again. So, uh, and in our larger study, we looked at that a little more carefully and um, we have a larger number. So it does show that there is some statistical significance to suggest that um, a rising thyroglobulin may be a hint that this is uh, going to work. 
So there were some adverse events. Um, and so we never talk about a treatment without potential side effects. So um, one of the patients had a pneumonitis. Uh, they were treated with 200 millicuries, so had a lifetime cum cumulative dose of 300 plus um, millicuries. They were treated by blood dosimetry, um, but they did, and they had, uh, you know, great lung uptake. It did resolve, and they, are, uh, they were fine in follow-up. And the second patient had, uh, there was a concern for uh, pulmonary fibrosis, um, and they were treated with 250 millicuries or a cumulative of 700 plus um, lifetime, and they also were treated by blood dosimetry. And the third patient, and that, that resolved, I apologize. Uh, the third patient developed um, sialadenitis and was treated with 200 millicuries of a cumulative 300 millicuries lifetime, and was also treated by blood dosimetry, but that also um, resolved. So um, they're not unexpected adverse events, but thankfully they did resolve. We always have to think about this when we're treating our patients. So in summary, um, it appears that radioactive iodine therapy after tumor uh, redifferentiation with targeted therapy offers durable responses, both radiographically and biochemically. You know, so that's it. I just wanted to share um, two things um, that you know we just need to assess longer term responses and determine an optimal schedule for the tar using the targeted therapy and who we would do this in, right? What are the subset of patients that are going to respond? Um, is it those patients with smaller disease, those who mount a sustained thyroglobulin, um, or are the NRAS mutated tumors more likely to respond since in, in several studies, those are the patients that look like they responded and only some of the BRAF uh, patients responded. And I love this um, uh, uh, illustration by that Dr. Tuttle shares when you think about these patients with distant metastases. And if we go on the right hand side, we want to think about are the patients who need radioactive iodine resensitization, do they need to have evidence of structural progression? Do they need to have bigger tumors? Or should we be thinking about would it be more effective in the smaller tumors um, in minimally progressive disease? And I think those things need to be worked out. And when we look at this drawing, um, you can't see my pointer, I apologize, but if we look at the radioactive iodine refractory subset of patients, will radioactive iodine more likely work on um, those patients that are in the middle uh, shown there? So with that, I just wanted to say um, that there's lots of clinical trials ongoing to answer this, and I want to thank you uh, for your attention, and I look forward to the lively discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, Nifa, that that was really great. Um, I am I'm was bummed that we lost you there at the end, but you came back strong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so listen, so I'm really glad that you mentioned um, that um, radioactive iodine was the first targeted therapy ever because that was what I decided to um, select for my title slide here, doubling down on the first ever precision oncology therapy. Um, I don't think that the Gleevec people in the world know that they were beaten out by uh, several decades by radioactive iodine, but they were. Um, so let's see, here are my disclosures. And, um, and so just uh, by way of introduction, I think NIFA um, very nicely mentioned the work um, from Memorial and Jim Fagan's group, Chakravarti. And, and so I'll just show you some pictures here of the mouse model where they have a BRAF V600E inducible mouse that develops thyroid cancers. And when um, these mice were, um, the BRAF V600E is induced uh, and then they're treated with a BRAF inhibitor bemurafenib, um, you can see that yeah, you can um, bring NIS expression back um, if when they're off, when the um, BRAF E600E is induced and then they're off of bemurafenib, you lose expression of NIS. Um, and then uh, um, it was also shown that a MEK inhibitor um, can uh, redifferentiate these uh, uh, tumors and, and show NIS expression as well. Um, and here's a, a pretty picture of the mice um, who um, the uninduced without the BRAF V600E expressed, um, those mice can take up radioactive iodine um, in their thyroid cancers um, when they have um, the uh, BRAF V600E induced by doxycycline, um, you don't see um, uh, any uptake um, of radioactive iodine, but then when they're treated with bemurafenib um, or the MEK inhibitor, again, you can, you can turn on NIS expression and, 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 and cause these um, little mouse 
thyroid cancers to take up radioactive iodine. Um, so that, of course, led to the selumetinib um, paper that, that NIFA showed you um, 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 by Alan Ho and colleagues at Memorial, um, where patients were treated with, um, with uh, selumetinib, the MEK inhibitor, um, and then um, had I-124 scans. Those that met the dosimetry threshold were then given radioactive iodine. And so if we take um, just add up all of the numbers, there were 22 patients that were enrolled. Um, and then of the patients that were eight patients um, had uptake that uh, high enough to justify treatment. Um, and then five patients overall who were treated on this paradigm did have resist um, partial responses for an overall response rate of, of 23%. Um, and that, of course, led to the ASTRA trial. Um, this um, was a phase three trial. It, the data have not yet been published, but have been presented by Allen at the ATA a couple of years ago. And so what ASTRA did was um, try to bring um, selumetinib um, to, to the upfront curative setting um, when patients are, are postoperative after having thyroidectomy, um, those that were identified to um, be at high risk for, for uh, disease recurrence um, were enrolled and, and randomized in a two to one fashion to receive selumetinib in combination with adjuvant radioactive iodine versus placebo and radioactive iodine. And then patients were um, followed um, with a primary endpoint in the trial of, of biochemical and structural complete response. Um, and this was the first, this was the only study that's ever been done um, in this patient population um, um, uh, looking at this uh, really important question. And I, I, I really liked the study for, for the reason that it was asking this question of can we how can we cure more patients um, because in oncology the more people we can actually cure um, really that's where great strides can be made so, um, so 400 patients were enrolled um, and um, and unfortunately, it was a negative trial. Um, and this is a big bummer because um, you know studies like this are are, are so uh, uh, labor intensive and and, and money intensive. Um, and if there's if if the first uh, paradigm is a big bust, it does make it hard to be able to do these landmark clinical trials again in the future. Um, but unfortunately, um, what we saw was that 40% um, of selumetinib patients um, did ha were in complete response um, after as, uh, uh, at 18 months, which was when the primary endpoint was measured, um, and 38% of patients um, were in complete response um, in the placebo arm, and there was no difference between those those two arms. Um, one thing that the study did show was that the the um, the hypothesis going into the trial was that um, approximately 30% of patients in this high risk group would be in complete response. Um, with radioactive iodine alone. And so the 38% in the placebo arm was fairly, um, uh, so the prediction was fairly on the mark in terms of, of the, that uh, prediction model. Um, toxicity was a bit of an issue. Selumetinib can cause a really awful acneiform rash, um, some other toxicities as well, including retinal toxicities. Um, and so 16% of patients did have grade three or higher adverse events. Um, and then another uh, part of the trial that I think was a challenge was feasibility. Um, so um, a study like this hadn't been done before, and um, there aren't um, patients who have thyroidectomy um, and then have adjuvant radioactive iodine. Iodine, um, whoever have medical oncologists in their lives or um, are on oncology drugs. And so um, there were um, 104 important protocol deviations um, in the study, um, which I think suggests that there's just a, a high learning curve when we're doing trials like this that are very complex that we haven't done before. Um, you know, interestingly, even when a, the post hoc exploratory analyses were done, taking a look at um, when, it, you know, if patients were um, all compliant with the therapy um, um, prior to taking radioactive iodine, um, and if you eliminate the patients that had the important protocol um, deviations, still um, we didn't see a statistically significant improvement with selumetinib compared to placebo. Um, there was a small numeric uh, difference if you look at 
at the patients who had at least 80% of their selumetinib doses um, and also completed all of the study assessments. Um, so perhaps um, uh, if everything had uh, gone perfectly, we would have seen a positive study, um, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. Um, I think you know one of the big important take-home messages is that this is this kind of approach um, is doable, um, and now we have a very good benchmark for future studies, um, which hopefully we'll be able to design at some point in the future. Um, so the story with selumetinib and radioactive iodine, however, isn't completely over. Um, there is an international thyroid oncology group trial um, looking at, at um, selumetinib um, um, versus placebo. Um, plus radioactive iodine um, in a randomized phase two trial, <clears throat> um, similar to the um, New England Journal of Medicine study, um, patients um, had to have um, uh, uh, some uptake of radioactive iodine at baseline in order to be eligible for this study. They had to have recurrent or metastatic resist measurable disease. So it's not in the adjuvant setting, it's in patients who have known uh, metastatic disease. And then patients were randomized to getting radioactive iodine alone or being pretreated with selumetin and followed by radioactive iodine. Um, so the study has completed enrollment um, and we're pretty far along in terms of uh, follow-up. Um, but the study has not yet been reported um, in abstract fashion. But stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll be seeing some results soon. Um, so this shows the, the dibrafenib tri trial. We did a small feasibility um, trial with dibrafenib in BRAF mutant diodine refractory uh, 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 metastatic uh, uh, patients um, that NIFA mentioned very nicely. Um, we uh, did this in 10 patients. Um, and six of the 10 patients did convert to having some uptake of radioactive iodine on a low dose four millicurie whole body scan. Those six patients all got radioactive iodine. Um, and then as Nifa mentioned, two of the six patients um, had a, a, a response. Um, so the overall response rate in this trial with this uh, strategy was 20%, but you know, only 10 patients. Um, the um, uh, Memorial Group um, did a similar trial um, looking at bemurafenib, um, the um, other BRAF inhibitor in patients with BRAF mutant uh, iodine refractory uh, DTC. They also treated 10 patients. They found an overall response rate in, in the 10 patients of 40%. Um, I don't show the waterfall plot here, but one of the nifty things about this um, trial was that they did pre and on treatment biopsies in three patients um, looking for um, looking at the biology of the disease. And, and so you can see here that um, the, the gray bars um, show the um, RNA-seq data uh, pre-treatment, and then the black bars um, show the uh, uh, patient's uh, biopsies um, on bemurafenib therapy. So here, if you look at the MAP output score, um, you can see um, um, a high MAP uh, kinase out output in patients prior to treatment, which is what you'd expect in these BRAF V600E tumors. And you can see those scores dropping on bemurafenib therapy. Um, and then they also took a look at the BRAF RAS score and showing that um, that can be changed, altered with a, a, a bemurafenib therapy, changing the phenotype of the tumor from a BRAF phenotype to a rat, more RAS-like uh, uh, tumor type. Um, and then also um, in looking at the enhanced thyroid differentiation score, um, the pre and, and on treatment biopsies show, show that you can really um, uh, see evidence of some um, uh, differentiation in these uh, uh, tumors on bemurafenib. Um, so that was a, a very uh, another very nice proof of principle study. Um, and of course, here are the data um, from the MD Anderson series of of, uh, of 13 patients that NIFA showed you um, with an overall response rate of 23% um, uh, in that patient population. 
Um, so, you know, I think we have a number of small studies now that have shown a proof of principle that you can redifferentiate some tumors um, by blocking the MAP kinase pathway. But we really need, um, if we, you know, we want to be able to do this and have it be uh, available to all patients, have insurance companies pay for it. Um, so we really need more definitive trials. Um, so one study that is larger that's underway um, is the study that um, is uh, being done on multicenter study being done in France that Sophie Le Beaulieu is the, the principal investigator of. Um, this is a, a non-randomized two-arm trial looking at um, a combination of dibrafenib and the MEK inhibitor trametinib in patients with BRAF mutant um, IDI refractory uh, uh, PTC or in uh, trametinib alone in the patients um, who, has, who have RAS mutant disease. And so um, they will be following uh, the patients for conversion to iodine sensitivity, and then ultimately um, uh, response rate and, and progression-free survival. Um, so it's a larger study, um, and um, depending on the results, hopefully um, we'll see promising results and maybe even enough patients um, to, to be able to have uh, groups like NCCN uh, recommend this treatment um, uh, for patients with iodine refractory disease. Um, the, uh, um, but I think, you know, we have a problem here, um, not just in this, the, the small proof of principle sample sizes for these clinical trials, um, but, you know, I want, I'm greedy. I, you know, I'm a medical oncologist. I want to see patients having response rates of 60, 65%. Um, and I want to see those, those responses last for a long time. Um, and um, I think that what we're seeing really um, is that uh, we do see relatively low overall response rates. And if, if we want patients to live longer, um, I think we need to see more robust activity. Um, and we've got issues here. So uh, with, um, in the RAS, uh, uh, RAF MAP kinase pathway is, it's not just a linear pathway. There are multiple um, uh, uh, feeders into the pathway. There's paradoxical signaling as well. Uh, so it's a complex pathway um, that has that behaves differently in different tissues. Um, and I think that we don't, we probably don't understand the biology uh, well enough really to come up with a good uh, a therapy uh, uh, that can redifferentiate uh, more tumors more effectively so that we can get higher response rates and get people to live longer. Um, and, and I think, you know, because we see um, we're, we're pre-treating patients just for three weeks or four weeks or maybe up to six weeks in these trials and only seeing um, patients convert uh, to radioactive iodine uptake at 60 percent, 40 percent. So I think that there's, in, there's some intrinsic resistance that we're looking at. Um, probably in part because it's not, these tumors are not a one-size-fits-all operation. There's a lot of genomic instability. This is something that uh, Carmelo Nucera, for example, has shown. Um, so, you know, he, uh, he's shown that there's um, copy uh, number gains of MCL1 and CDK and 2A loss um, that in the BRAF, um, B600E uh, papillary thyroid cancers um, that uh, uh, cause de novo resistance to vemurafenib by promoting um, survival and escape from cell cycle arrest. Um, and then also um, we see um, the, the uglier tumors um, can harbor um, uh, uh, pic 3 ca mutations as well. Um, and we see those in the more de-differentiated tumors. And um, this cartoon here shows how you can get how the pic 3 ca mutations actually can give, um, can increase um, uh, ERK signaling paradoxically in the setting of a BRAF inhibitor um, because the BRAF inhibitor in a BRAF V600E model Model will cause binding with CRAF, and then with a PI3 kinase stimulation, you actually get paradoxical hyperactivation of ERK signaling. Um, so um, I think that there is some intrinsic cell resistance that we're dealing with, uh, but then there's also acquired resistance that's been described as well. Um, for example, um, uh, you know the the uh, vemurafenib studies have shown that you can get 
chromosome 5 amplification and, and mutations in RNA binding motif genes that so you get loss of cell cycle regulation and that's something that Carmelo's group has shown um, and then Fagan's group has shown that that treatment um, with these uh, uh, tumors uh, 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 with uh, vemurafenib can actually induce HER3 transcription and autokine neuregulin secretion which again causes rebound in Burke signaling um, so I think that we're dealing with problems of both intrinsic uh, resistance um, in the pathway as well as acquired resistance um, and so I think we need to figure out how to overcome those resist understand the resistance mechanisms a little bit better and overcome them um, Here's a nice picture of Alan Ho. Um, so I get jealous because Alan Ho is the Jeffrey Bean uh, 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 facu junior faculty chair. We don't have those kinds of sexy uh, chairs in, in Boston. We're a much more staid town here. Um, so I'm, I'm jealous of how cool Alan is. Um, but anyway, so Alan um, is the PI of, I think, you know, was a very interesting study looking at vemurafenib plus this PI3 kinase inhibitor, copanlisib, um, which is FDA approved in follicular lymphoma um, as pretreatment for radioactive iodine. Um, so hopefully this blockade of both the BRAF pathway and the PI3 kinase pathway will lead to um, uh, uh, much stronger um, uptake of sodium iodine and, and, and the, the, the processing of, of iodine within the cells. Um, I think there are some other interesting tidbits um, on the horizon. Um, so um, this is a, 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 a correspondence that was just re recently published in New England Journal of Medicine by Grossin and colleagues from, from um, France. Um, they reported on a woman with papillary thyroid cancer for 34 years. Um, she had received um, uh, more than 1,400 millicuries of radioactive iodine over the 34 years of, of her thyroid cancer existence. Um, she had been stable for 12 years after her last radioactive iodine treatment, but then eventually progressed. So she was treated with lenvatinib. Um, it, it had to be stopped, however, because of adverse uh, effects. And at that time, they did tumor genotyping and identified an EML4 and TREC3 fusion. Um, so if you think about it, um, this woman um, um, was 30 years old when she was diagnosed, and we know that these fusions are uh, more common in um, the pediatric and young adult uh, cancer patient population. So perhaps not a big surprise that she had this NTREC3 fusion. Um, so she was started on the NTREC inhibitor lerotrectinib. Um, and, um, and Grossan did um, a, an iodine uptake scan um, after she had been on lerotrectinib for just three weeks. And so you see those images over here, and she had a beautiful uptake in, um, uh, with radioactive iodine. Um, they kept her on lerotrectinib, however, because she was already responding, she was tolerating it very well, and she had had so much um, prior radioactive iodine therapy. Um, but a very nice, again, proof of principle that blocking the NTREC inhibitor pathway can lead to uptake of radioactive iodine. Um, the um, um, uh, other tidbits, um, so you can do the same thing with RET fusions, it turns out. Um, this is um, from a, a, a paper that's been submitted for publication by um, uh, uh, Young Ju Park and her colleagues from Seoul National University in, in, in Korea. Um, they had a seven-year-old girl with diffuse uh, sclerosing variant PTC who had lung metastases at diagnosis. And um, she had thyroidectomy and then minimal uptake on uh, with radioiodine treatment after her surgery. Um, she had rapidly progressive disease. They found a RET fusion by FISH, and that was confirmed by NGS testing. So she had a, a CCDC6 RET fusion. Um, they, um, they were able to obtain LOXO292 or selpercatinib on a single patient IND. Um, and the, the, this young girl um, had a partial response just at four weeks of therapy. Um, they did a radioactive iodine um, scan after she'd been on their therapy for five months. And you can see there that she had um, 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 uh, redifferentiation with the inhibition of the RET uh, uh, kinase pathway with selpercatinib. Um, because she was on the single patient IND, they weren't able to give her another cancer therapy. So she wasn't treated with radioactive iodine. But again, there's a proof of principle here that blocking this pathway uh, can lead to iodine resensitivity. And it's actually on the basis of these data and some others that um, um, ITOG is now uh, developing a clinical trial looking um, at sulfur 
Ocatinib for redifferentiation for patients with RET fusion positive um, iodine refractory thyroid cancer. Um, so more to come uh, along uh, those lines, I hope, in the future. Um, but, but you know, basically just to wrap things up very quickly, um, treating radioiodine refractory DTC by drugging an activated ERK pathway with gene-specific therapy to redifferentiate um, these cancers and then give them iodine, uh, radioactive iodine, I really do think is the kind of ultimate cool thing to do with precision, precision medicine for these patients. Um, and I think we've seen very nice proof of principles with these studies, including um, the nice MD Anderson study that NIFA showed. Um, but I think, you know, have we really seen bona fide clinical benefit in these um, small proof of principle studies? Um, I actually think that these um, overall response rates are, are kind of disappointing. Um, if we are going to translate um, this to um, having people live longer, I think we need to see higher response rates and, and more durable responses as well. Um, before we can really kind of take that leap of faith that we're um, helping people live longer. Um, and I think we, we really, you know, uh, need definitive clinical trials um, beyond the ASTRA trial um, in order to make progress uh, for the future. With that, I'll wrap things up. I hope we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Terrific. Um, thank you, uh, Lori, for a great discussion and uh, for an outstanding presentation this morning. Um, in the few um, uh, waning moments here, just wanted to get a sense on whether the experience is that if you're successful in achieving redifferentiation um, and improved uptake with radioactive iodine, uh, do those tumors retain that um, redifferentiated status or do they tend to revert over time? Namely, what's the experience with retreating with radioactive iodine at some interval um, after the first uh, the first round of um, of post therapy treatment Naifa, have you retreated any patients in, at MD Anderson so yeah so we've done um, a few patients um, and we you know we should look at this more systematically but if you know, just to clarify, if Dr. Erkin's asking, so if you give the targeted therapy, you treat with iodine, then you're no longer on the targeted therapy. I don't think anybody's looked at repeating a whole body scan off of the targeted therapy. I'm not, I don't, I don't have a good reason why that would work. You're off the targeted therapy. But what has been done is, and in very few patients for us, um, is you give them the targeted therapy, treat with iodine, they get a response, right? You do, you see them every three months and, and when they progress, you repeat it. And there have been, and again, how do we predict these people? There have been some patients who've had response after repeating BRAF, and I've had two that have responded after repeating MEC. But it's like, Lori, you know, Dr. Worth brings up excellent points, right? I mean, we want those durable responses. We want those cures. And we're talking a year and a half or, or you know, two years off of therapy as opposed to life. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Worth, you can uh, comment on yours. Yeah. So, um, so I, I, you know, I think that the question of of retreating patients is really important. And, um, if, you know, I think the endocrinologists know this a lot better than I do. But if you have a patient who has um, iodine sensitive disease um, and um, they're treated with radioactive iodine, uh, you see some activity there, um, some improvement in thyroglobulin and hopefully even in tumor measurements, you're not just going to stop, right? You're going to give them another dose of radioactive iodine six months or a year later. Um, and so I think the studies now are beginning to incorporate that paradigm. Um, so we're going to, we're planning on doing that in that ITOG um, sulpercatinib trial, for example, um, so that patients will be able to have a second treatment course of sulpercatinib and radioactive iodine um, uh, when they've had benefit with the first therapy. Um, uh, um, and, and that's already incorporated into the study design. Great. Um, and if you could um, both comment in the final minute here, um, is there any, any um, information as to whether treating with a different um, form of targeted therapy uh, for patients who do not achieve um, redifferentiation with one, whether or not that's a strategy that's likely to be successful, um, or is this an intrinsic um, resistance uh, that um, unlikely we're going to be able to overcome uh, with different agents? 
Interesting. I don't know if Dr. Worth wants to comment on that. If I understood the question correctly, meaning if you give, let's say, dibrafenib um, for a month or two, and then you did a whole body scan and they didn't take up, could you go ahead and try a different BRAF inhibitor? Is that the question? Or try like a MEK inhibitor at that point? Exactly. Oh, interesting. Um, I have never done that. Now, I think that, you know, if you had not had a mutation, right, or that you didn't know that you had a mutation or an alteration, and then you gave like a MEK inhibitor, which is often done, and then you had a little bit of uptake or didn't have much, but then later you found a RET fusion, right? You saw Dr. Worth, what she presented, or an NTREC because our testing, did, you know, we, we weren't testing for it properly. That has happened, but that's not answering your question. So I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Dr. Worth, we have more. Yeah. yeah, I don't. So I, I agree. We don't have the we don't have the answers, but it's definitely a good question. Um, and there are, you know, some drugs are better than others. Um, selimetinib is not the best MEK inhibitor um, out there. And um, so um, can we um, use more effective um, uh, gene specific therapy and get more mileage? Probably. Um, but we don't I don't think we really have data on that. Great. Yet. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Um, unfortunately, we've got a slew of questions that have come in at the end here, which we unfortunately do not have time to get to. I want to thank you both again uh, um, for outstanding presentations. This has been really um, a wonderful session, and thank everybody who's in attendance um, for their uh, participation. Next week, uh, we will be slightly switching gears and talking about um, uh, patients with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer who present during pregnancy. Um, so I hope that you'll join us and everybody um, stay safe. Hopefully you, you will be you will get vaccinated um, if you haven't already very shortly. And um, everybody have a great weekend. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Erkin. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Busnidi. Okay.